Thank you very much, Professor Zedin, for this uh, nice talk uh, on uh, a relevant aspect of, of vitiligo. So we have to take in consideration how relevant is the psychological situation of patients with vitiligo, and, uh, because frequently, you know, the, the, the people say, don't worry about that because you can cover, it's not so relevant, you can have more serious disease like that. And probably we have to underline how it, 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 it is relevant this for the, 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 the quotidianity of the life of the patients with vitiligo. Uh, you know, you, you have underlined the differences uh, and among the different uh, world region. Probably you can spend a, a couple of words more about that, considering that now we probably we have an audience that belong from Far East to Far West. Far West. I, I think, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Picardo, for, for your question. I think that probably the cultural background is very important in the psychosocial comorbidities. Uh, probably that, uh, uh, living in Europe and living in India or in the Middle Eastern is not the same because uh, uh, the cultural uh, background is very important. In, in <clears throat> I've lived in Africa for almost uh, 20 years when, when I was born in Senegal. And Bitlago was often uh, said to be like leprosy. And I think this idea is coming from very far, from the ancestry, uh, where probably uh, Saint George uh, in, the, in the Bible uh, was thought to have vitiligo rather than uh, leprosy. And these beliefs are very important. Unfortunately, in the studies that we did, we were not able, because we do not have uh, enough uh, individuals to evaluate the, the impact of this cultural background. But this is something that we certainly should take into account when discussing the, the psychosocial comorbidities. Professor Spritz, it seems that uh, he has uh, a question to raise. Probably, Rich, you can switch on your microphone and you can raise the question. Oh, well, it was basically the question that you just asked. Um, I, I wondered when you, <laughs> what I wondered was with the spread of uh, stigmatization from 17 to 100 percent. When you looked at the individual studies, was the 17 percent from North America and the 100 percent from India, for example, how it broke down geographically? But I think you've already addressed that. Uh, yeah, I think I addressed that. And the problem is that for the moment, the stigmatization is not, we don't have any instrument of measure of stigmatization. And because I think that uh, this is why probably it's not done everywhere. And even if it's not declared stigmatization, it's just because most of the studies have not asked for it. And mm -hmm. we probably need to specifically ask for stigmatization to know exactly the burden. But yes, I think stigmatization in, I, I think that one of the uh, stories that has been reported to me by someone, uh, by uh, the, the, pre the, the former president of the, uh, society of UK society of vitiligo uh, is that she received uh, in the organization for the patient organization someone who was seeking how to uh, amputate his arm and she said why do you want to amputate your arm and he said because I have vitiligo and I can get married he was Pakistani in origin so to show how vitiligo can be impact, impacting the life is the, of, of the patients, it's very important and probably more in those uh, countries like uh, Middle Eastern or uh, Asia, where it can uh, uh, you, you can it can avoid you to be to get married for a girl or for uh, for a boy uh, as well. And this is very important. Yeah, the cultural background is really important in stigmatization. Thank you very much. Professor Zedin, 